Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, regular meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee for June 5th, 2017. Uh, I'm Paul Krikorian, joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Blumenfield and Councilmember Bonin, and we are ready to begin. Uh, we have a, a quite a extensive agenda today. Um, so, members, let's see. Yeah. Um, I would propose item number 12 as a consent item for approval unless you have questions or comments. And um, if there are none, it would be the action of the committee to approve uh, item number 12 uh, on consent. 7, 8, and 11 I would also propose as uh, for consent approval, but we do have cards on those matters. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take uh, Mr. Spindler while you're looking at those to see whether you have any questions or concerns. So Mr. Spindler, come on up. You have two minutes plus one minute for general public comment. Oh, uh, just uh, what? Uh, for the record, sir, uh, for item number 12, that would be the city attorney and CAA reports, resolution, and ordinance. Thank you. So we start back with number 11, go back to the back table and look. Did you know that the city technically went bankrupt in the first part of the fiscal year last year? $400 million in the hole. No, you didn't know that. So the city in number 11 is going to issue a note payable in one year, June 2018, with interest for $1 billion, $500 million, payable to the city's pension funds because they've taken all the money. What's that we're getting up? Yes, go back and read. Look at your bankrupt city in number 11. One billion five hundred million dollars in a bond to cover up the bankruptcy of this fucking city. You never read about this in the papers, John and Ken on the radio. Where the fuck is the media? The media is shit in the city. That's why we don't know. We don't know the evil within. So good luck on paying that one. Point five billion dollars with interest by June 2018. I don't like your odds. Now, why are you bankrupt? Let's go to number four. Roy Galvan versus City of Los Angeles. A Latino gentleman sitting at home with a broken foot, accused of running away on a murder. And the police department paid in city funds a hundred thousand, what was it here? $10,000 to two homeless people they beat to go to court and lie that they saw Mr. Galvan commit the murder. Spent 13 months in jail, found not guilty. He sued the city in 2014 in federal court. According to Judge Snyder, there has been a filing of a settlement offer in March. But you're fucking around now because you don't have the money to pay until the next fiscal year begins, so you're not going to be able to pay until fiscal year 2018, which starts July 1st. So this is what you have. Outside council firms, $845,000 in additional outside council monies being paid on number seven. Number eight, more money for outside attorneys. You people can't stop. But I suggest also you hire outside counsel for Wayne Spindler versus City of Los Angeles and Wayne Spindler versus Hugo Rossiter, who I'm going to file a bar complaint against yesterday, to tomorrow, because Hugo Rossiter, city attorney, files fake documents and perjured documents in our courts. You people are scum. Absolute scum. Thank you, Mr. Spindler. Oh, okay. Okay. And we're Mary joined Martinez by, is here. Mr. Spindler, be silent or leave. Be well, silent. Or, okay, Mr. Spindler yeah, needs to go. Mr. Spindler here. needs to go. He's disrupting well, the meeting. Puppet, You're excluded from the meeting. Officers, show him to the door. Show him to the door with dispatch, please. Show me to the door. 
So as most of the general managers of the city are sitting in this room waiting to conduct the business of the Budget and Finance Committee, Mr. Spindler continues to delay the meeting. He continues to delay the meeting and interrupt the meeting. Mr. Spindler will not be returning today. Have a good day, Mr. Spindler. All right. Um, we have, uh, Ms. Martinez, we had proposed item 7, 8, 11, and 12 for consent approval. Um, we've taken public comment on those matters. Public comment on those and all other matters is now closed. General public comment is closed. And Mr. Blumenfield had a question on item number 12. Yeah. We, so technically we approved it. So without objection, we'll reconsider it. And uh, go ahead, Mr. Blumenfield. So is there staff on number 12 who can respond to a quick question? Item number 12 of the City Attorney and CA reports resolution and ordinance relative to authorization to issue general obligation refunding bond series 2017-A taxable for Proposition HHH projects in an aggregate amount not to exceed $100 million. General obligation refunding bond series 2017-B tax exempt for refundings and adding a section to the Los Angeles Administrative Code to create a related special fund. So the, the, the question sort of general, given is inspired by some of the other items on this agenda, um, concern that we're not able to enforce the um, affordability restrictions. And so what assurances do we have that, the, that with, these, with this new funding that we're going to be able to enforce the affordability restrictions of these projects as we move forward? We need the program people for that. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Yolanda Chavez with the CAO's office. Um, all of the projects that are, all the units that are being funded under Prop HHH that are supportive housing have to meet an affordability restriction for 55 years. So there's a covenant that, it, that um, runs with the land. And so what that means is that when we do the bond issue and the developers actually sign the covenant, it will be recorded with the county. Just like we do our leases, it will be recorded with and the county. if they violate that covenant, do we have to inform them that they violated it? Or is it automatically that if they violated it, they violated it? Oh, and it's... They, and they it's, we then sue them or get our money back. It's automatic if they ever violate that because the department is notified. HCID would be notified if it was violated. But I can tell you that in general, affordable housing developers do not violate the covenants because they want to receive continued funding for their projects. Right, so they can't sell the, they can't, the problem will be when they move forward, let's say a developer does violate and decides to sell the property to a private party and they pull title on it, right, right and they go to get their permitting and they want to do something different, the title won't allow them to do it because so they, they had this. If they violate it and we don't notify them that they're violating it, does so that I, de facto make that, that unit okay? So I, I should also note that HCID actually part of the responsibility is that they monitor the units for occupancy. So annually the uh, developer owner has to actually report the income levels for the individuals that live in those units. So this is very different from the RSO. These are affordable units that um, are also funded with tax credits. They have to be monitored annually for occupancy. And again, the covenants and the restrictions run with the land. Okay, I guess I won't, I won't go any further. I'm going to bring this back up in related closed session items. I, won't, I don't want to veer off the track too much. Uh -oh. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want to chime in on Mr. Blumenfield's point, though. Uh, he raises a very good point. And uh, honestly, I, I don't think the response gets to, to Mr. Blumenfield's point at all. There's problems with monitoring and enforcement of existing units. Your, your response was, well, you have to have the unit be enforced, have the unit be affordable. But just saying that doesn't mean it's the case. There, I, I hear about problems all the time. Uh, so it, it's, this isn't the opportunity to, to really get into the weeds on it, but we have to make sure that with these funds, we do a better job 
monitoring and making sure that the units actually are enforceable than has historically been done with, with units covenanted affordable. Right. And I'm not sure if um, HCIT is here. I mean, we're with the CEO's office. They, they're probably the most appropriate folks to respond since they actually run the occupancy unit for affordable units. Are they here? They may be here when we go into closed session. But we will we will send an email to them, I think, we and will. ask them the question before it goes to count this goes to council on Wednesday. The program itself is going to council on the ninth, so there'll be another opportunity to talk about the program itself on the ninth. Well, we're also going to HMP and, and housing committee on Wednesday, so we'll be sure that they have and that the response. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be asking it then. Okay. Yeah, right. I'd love to see the response before it goes before it goes to council. Okay. okay. Um, as we're all saying, it's, it's there. Are, there are problems, and we need to we need to figure out a system so that moving forward, we have belt and suspenders, um, okay. because we're putting a lot of money in, and, and I think in the past some of that money is now in jeopardy because we didn't we didn't monitor for it. Yeah. Ms. Martinez. Do we know how many applicants submitted proposals? Did we have an overwhelming amount of proposals submitted? So on the housing side. Um, the council gave H the authority to go to the projects that were in their pipeline and they were ready to be financed. So the nine projects were those that came through their process and are ready to be financed. On the facility side, we did have, we actually received 25 proposals and through a very expedited RFP of two weeks. Do we know if these projects have site control yet? They all have site control. One of the requirements of bond council was for them to be shovel ready and to be completed in two years. So that was one of the requirements. So they have to break ground within 12 months of the bond issuance and uh -huh. expand the, the appropriation within 24 months. Right. And do we anticipate another round of uh, awards next fiscal year? Yes. Yeah, so what we're coming forward on the policy report on Wednesday to HMP and Housing and then Council on Friday are actually the recommendations for the next facilities RFP. And HCIT will, will be recommending their application process for the next rounds of the housing Prop HHH. Gen application process. So general obligation bonds are ad valorem tax, which means it gets added to your property tax. So in order for us to add it to the property tax to pay the debt service on the bonds, we actually have, ev have to have everything done by like now. That's why we're coming now in order to give the, the amount to the assessor's office. So that's why we're doing it once a year. Right, Mr. Blumenfield, question on it. <coughs> slightly different. So the, the um, the range of costs for development costs swing pretty widely on this. Like developments between 389 and 585, and you're talking huge swings. And, and in terms of the same thing with acquisition, hard costs, soft costs, it's a pretty big range. So how are we um, how are we ranking these or, or rating them when um, when the range is so large? So again, HCIT would be the expert, but I can tell you that the difference is probably in the type of tax credits they're using. If the projects are being financed with 9%, that provide 9% tax credits, that provides a lot more equity so that our gap investment is not as much. I think most of these projects are being funded with 4% tax credits in an effort to expedite the projects because we don't, because 9% tax credits are competitive. Um, the, the city does not receive um, as, as much of that as a nine, as a four percent, which are non-competitive, and so when they when a project is funded with four percent, you have to it doesn't provide as much equity, so then our gap has to be larger. So I think if you look at the difference on the chart, whether they're nine percent or four percent, that's probably the difference. So we're we just talking about our cost, like when 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 I read about the development cost being three eighty nine to five eighty five. No, that's not ours. That's a total cost per unit. Ours would be probably about a third or a fourth of that. Right. So, so why does the financing gap impact that range? Because uh, it be, because think of what it. The, yeah, go ahead. Right, because think of it in terms of the all the various sources that are used to fund a unit. If if a project 
does receive 9% tax credits, we would expect to fund about a third of the project. No, I understand why it affects the amount that we would end up with, but the overall development cost, oh, in terms of the, the cost overall of the acquisition project. cost, be, yeah. those have this, this huge range. Yeah. It you know, could, which it, again, HC would probably be the best to answer that question since they reviewed the application. So it could be the type of project, the size of the project, the amenities within the project, but um, unfortunately, uh, I am not the expert on their um, on their and, pipeline. And the reason projects. I ask, you know, besides sort of the interest in knowing how that's done, is is making sure that we're maximizing our the our gap. dollars here, because if the range is so wide, then there may be a also a very wide range in in the efficiency of this, and if we can we can tamp down on that, then we could get a lot more housing for our dollar. Definitely. I can tell you that one of um, HSID's goals is to continue to identify leveraging sources. And I think when the Home for Good program um, um, is implemented in January by the state, that will give us an additional leveraging source so that hopefully our um, but, part of the but cost the will be less. Money shouldn't impact the you, you're right. It could be also the, the construction environment currently is, um, as you probably know, continues to rise because there's so because there's so much construction and it's very challenging for developers to actually find construction companies that are willing and able to take the job. So a lot of them are having to bring workers in from out of state. So all of that has increased construction cost. That's another I mean, I can issue. imagine all the reasons you're thinking. I could imagine even 10 more. I guess it's something. I'm not, I don't want to hold up this item because we need to move forward on it. But I want to, at some point, drill down on this um, in terms of making sure that we're being as efficient as, as we can, regardless of the source of revenue. Um, because, of course, with, when there's a big chunk of money out there like this, there's going to be a temptation to take all comers and... Right. and it's not necessarily in our best interest. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything further on number 12, members? All right, uh, with seeing no other comments, uh, items 7, 8, 11, and 12 are approved. And uh, we're going to hold our closed session items for the moment, and we'll go next to Item number nine, the year-end FSR. Item number nine is the CR report relative to the year-end financial status report for fiscal year 2016-17. So members, I'm going to ask the CAO uh, to give their overview, and then we'll do the roll call of departments, and uh, we'll be able to let everybody else go. Uh, if we don't have questions. So, Mr. Llewellyn, welcome. Yes, sir. Very briefly, council members, I want to thank the council and the mayor for their efforts in managing our challenges this year. Um, as you know, uh, we have reported in the second and third FSR is a tough year, um, particularly with liability claims, new labor agreements, um, and some shortfalls in human resources benefits. Um, today, we present the year in financial status report, our last of the year. The reserve fund, as you know, we began the year with a strong reserve fund of almost 6%, well above our 5% policy, due particularly to the significant increase in liability claims this year. As we have reported, we dropped just below the 5% for the first time since 12-13. The current reserve fund, as we report, is at 4.9, marginally below our 5% threshold and something your committee has made very clear to us you want to get back to. Combined with the Budget Stabilization Fund, your rainy day fund, we are at 6.6, .6, but we are pleased to report, as you know, in your next year's budget, you are back over five as adopted. Revenues, our current report, in a positive sense, notes that after we have closed the revenue gap and appear to be finishing the year above budget. Um, our shortfalls in things like the power transfer have been made up with better TOT, particularly due to short-term rentals, and better business tax growth. Unfortunately, since we only 
submitted this report Wednesday of last week. Already our end of month um, receipts are looking a little soft, so we need to follow that very closely. Um, we will get new receipts later this week. Uh, we may be slightly below at year end instead of slightly above. Um, we may need to ask your council for authority to adjust um, as the weeks go on, the next two weeks. We will get back to you on that. We still wish, if at all possible, to hit our financial status, our financial revenue rules, particularly our 5%. We will be getting back to you on that. On expenditures, as you know, our last report said we still had to find almost 21, um, 27 million. We are here to report happily. We have actually found that in expenditures. We are going to actually finish the year at zero. Um, uh, and that covers our, particularly our new labor agreements in fire and city attorney, which they were not budgeted for. Um, we make various recommendations for expenditure and uh, revenue in our final report. In closing, we urge your council and the mayor to continue extreme fiscal restraint um, and to continue watching the reserve fund. As you know, last week our fire and police pension fund looked at its earnings and looked at its actuarial assumptions and changed its expectations going forward, something we had expressed to you some weeks back that they were looking at. That will not hit our budget in the coming fiscal year, but in the following fiscal year, that will increase our pension obligation to the police and fire pension. Uh, we expect LACERS will take that up this summer as well. So that may be another hit for the following year. Um, in addition, we're all watching Washington. The current proposed budget has dramatic cuts in CDBG, HOME, FEMA, and our Homeland Security grants. Um, we don't know how that's going to turn out but we certainly need to be cautious and restrained as we proceed. Um, and we continue to recommend that departments with hiring behind federal grants be particularly cautious and weigh each hire before they make them. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our FSR guru, one of the very smartest in our office, and we have a lot of smart ones, Maria Gutierrez. Good afternoon, members of this committee. Maria Gutierrez with the CAO's office. In addition to offsetting our uh, $20.8 million uh, year-end expenditure shortfalls, we have basically a total of $130.4 million uh, transactions in this report. Um, we have transfers of approximately $7.31 million to the UB 2016-17 budgetary shortfalls account from savings that we have identified in the capital administration, capital finance administration fund, and salary savings in the Bureau of Contract Administration. We have recommendations to exempt up to 40.6 million from the general fund encumbrance policy. Uh, this policy requires that any funds uh, that remain encumbered from 2015, 16 and earlier be automatically disencumbered and reverted to the reserve fund. About 40.6 million uh, would be exempted from this, and this is all uh, identified in attachment 18. We uh, have recommendations to approve up to 6.3 million in general fund reappropriations uh, for next year. Uh, some of this is tied to uh, the acceleration of the SMS uh, encumbrance uh, deadlines this year, that some departments were not able to uh, purchase items in a timely manner. Uh, some are due to uh, ongoing contractual obligations that need to be met, funds that need to be in place early next year. Um, we are also increasing appropriations to the uh, UB reserve for unrealized revenue account by $3.9 million. Um, this is actually, uh, this represents funding that is not backed by cash. Uh, this is in recognition of revenue that will not be received from the Department of Water and Power regarding elections reimbursements and electric vehicle rebates. We have also submitted to you some amendments to our report. Um, this is as a result of information that came to our attention after the release of the year-end FSR. 
We are recommending amendments to attachment five. In attachment five, we have included a new recommendation to transfer approximately 1.13 million from the city clerk's salaries as needed account to the elections account. These funds are needed to offset uh, additional shortfalls in the elections account. They are also needed to offset a proposed reduction in the UB 2016-17 budgetary shortfalls account that was reflected in our report. We have uh, recommendations to uh, the revised attachment seven. This is recommendation number five. It came to our attention that the, depart uh, the fire department uh, needs to transfer $150,000 internally to offset uh, a deficit in the purchase of apparatus and fleet maintenance parts. Uh, we are reducing the city clerk's uh, transfer to the UB budgetary, from the UB budgetary shortfalls account um, to elections, the elections account by 384,186. Uh, and there is a corresponding increase uh, for uh, the city attorney uh, in the same amount. Um, this is due to uh, uh, information that came to our attention that there are uh, special funds that were previously assumed to offset a portion of the city attorney's sh uh, shortfall uh, c cannot be used uh, to offset it. Uh, so it's a general fund obligation. And uh, lastly, um, Due to the revenue issues uh, that we raised earlier, we are uh, recommending that uh, we add an instruction that city departments immediately transfer all department and grant revenue per the 1617 revised revenue budget to include all estimated related costs and directed costs reimbursements through June 30, 2017. We're available to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you. So, members, before we get to the departmental questions, any general questions for the CAO? Okay. Thank you. And, so, Mr. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, we also have an um, amendment to the FSR from the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, at some point, did you want that read into the record? Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and read that in now. We, have cop we should have copies distributed, I think. Correct. The Chief Legislative Analyst Amendment to the year-end fourth financial status report is as follows. Number one, transfer 500000 in AB 1290 funding, Council District 14 as follows. A, 150000 to the Council Fund as Needed Salaries account to support operational expenses. And B, 350000 to the Council District Community Services, Council District 14 account for community service and events in Council District 14. Additionally, the Chief Legislative Analyst is proposing item number two, which is to authorize the controller to reappropriate funds in the amount of 13,440 to the Neighborhood Empowerment Fund number 44B-47, account number 471082, for moving costs accrued between 2015 and 2016, pursuant to Council File number 16-1251. Uh, item number two is not reflected in the attachment that uh, was distributed to the members. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for the CAO members? Uh, the only question I have is actually related to grid, but there was an indication that um, about $18 million of contracted expenses have not been spent yet. Um, What's the, do you know what the reason for that is, first of all? And then, um, and then I have a follow-up, I guess. I would like to defer to the mayor's office on that. Mayor's office on that okay. One. Okay. Is there somebody from the mayor's office who can speak to GRID here? Okay. So um, then I'll just get to my follow-up comment, uh, which is uh, a lot of what we focus on in all of the FSRs, understandably, is uh, when departments seem to be uh, overspending or when we are projecting that there may be a correction needed uh, to avoid a deficit at the year end. But to me, equally important is ensuring that departments are doing what we've budgeted them to do. And so um, 
I would just make a, I guess, an informal request that as we go through FSRs throughout the year, um, it's important, and I hate to burden you further with the things that we do with each FSR, but if there are uh, situations like that where in mid-year it seems like we're not on, we're not spending quickly enough, uh, then I would like to, those to be brought to our attention early so we can figure out how to work with a department to encourage them. It's great to be cost efficient. It's great to, you know, be, to try to be tight with a buck, but we budget money so that it can be spent on services. And I, well, it, we don't want people overspending. We also don't want them underspending either. So the earlier in the year we can uh, determine that, the easier it is for us to fix that problem. And then likewise, you know, as we're starting to get into a, a world of performance metrics and gradually, baby step by baby step, we're integrating metrics into the budget itself, um, I, I would like to work with your office and the CLA's office to try to regularize the check-in with each department on how are they doing on their metrics rather than waiting until our budget hearings and saying, how'd you do last year? I think it's better if we, throughout the course of the year, make sure that people are on pace to meet their goals because they're more than goals. These are how we're holding people accountable and you know, ensuring that our budget uh, imperatives are being performed. So uh, I guess that's more of a comment. Ms. Martinez. I do have a question for the CEO's office, actually. Um, so since you mentioned that the federal government is proposing to eliminate CDBG funds, do we have an estimate, uh, a financial estimate of what that looks like, and how, how much of our city operations are currently being funded by CDBG funds? Uh, Councilmember, we are actually are preparing and finalizing a report, which we hope we'll have out either this week or next week on all federal grants, including CDBG, but we get them across the spectrum. Yeah. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, well, then let's go to departmental issues, um, starting with Mr. Bonnet. Really? Okay. Ms. Martinez? <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean that to be personal to you. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> well, we can correct that problem easily enough. Mr. Blumenfield. <laughs> I don't have a lot. I have one a small question for the clerk's office. But okay. Good. Clerk? Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm shocked too. No, I, I'm we just finished the whole budget process. You know. we're, we're, yeah. Really? I'm, I'm, I don't have any. Wow. Okay. See, now this is a sign of success. <laughs> when we get to the year end, we've erased, you know, a substantial 10-digit uh, yes. potential budget deficit at <laughs> the year end, and we have no questions for departments other than a brief question for the clerk. That's a pretty good sign. You sure? Last call. Last call. I can make stuff up if you want. Look at, look at poor Holly. I'm sorry, Holly. <laughs> All right. Everybody else but Holly, thank you for coming down. You're free to go. We appreciate your being here and appreciate your great work in getting through this budget year as, in as healthy a way as we have. Yeah, it's just, we did just do yeah. much. It's empty. Yeah. Right, that's true. <laughs> I just told Mike, maybe we're just brain dead. We're just like... But now we're looking retrospectively instead of post-mortem. I mean, I could ask. I, I had a question. Well, yeah. You're right. But we're making hedge to do that. Yeah. And the can open the Yeah, no, I don't have props. That's my problem. She's here. She's come yeah, I, think Bob's here. Yeah. I said I had a question too. Okay, folks, I know you're excited, but if you, we do have work to do. So if you could please exit the room quickly and quietly, and I'm going to ask Miss Wal ask Miss Walcott to come up. Mr. Blumenfield. It's hard to sing. Yeah, it wasn't that. Uh, it's just a, a relatively small question, which is. The, um, the ballot measures. I, I thought originally when we were putting them on the ballot that by putting DWP first, 
we would then only have to pay the marginal cost for our other ballot measures, and that was part of our rationale for doing it. Oh, yeah. Then when you look through this, we're, we're splitting it up, you know, even Steven, one quarter for each of, each of the ballot measures. I don't think it would have made a difference because we would have, these were all important ballot measures, but it did strike a curious note with me, so I thought I would ask and um, why why it mattered to put them first if we're going to split it up equally anyway. Or maybe I'm reading it wrong. Okay, Holly Walcott, city clerk for the city of Los Angeles, <laughs> obviously. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm going to answer your question correctly, but I'm going to take a stab at it. Okay, the, the um, ballot measures for November were never funded, so that's why we're having a shortfall and moving money around. But as far as why one was done first, it's always when you're putting um, ballot measures on the county, how we describe how we have to pay for it as we say it's four million dollars for the first or whatever the dollar amount was 3.8 million dollars for the first one and then each subsequent one after that is um, a certain amount above it so let's say it was four million dollars for the first and five hundred thousand for each one at, at the end when they're when they're going for the revenue, and when I say they, I'm talking about the CAO, when they're going for the revenue, I don't know that it would be fair to charge back DWP for 100% of what the entire costs were for 400. So why one was earlier than another, I don't know that that would matter as so much as hmm. that's probably why a $4 million revenue was anticipated at, up front is because they didn't know what the other, how many more were going to be there on top of it. But I can only guess because it was the CAO that estimated the revenue. So then I must have misunderstood it at the beginning, thinking that it was thinking that there was a, a more, a, a bigger nut on the first one, because otherwise we might have had a different choices in how we... Well, there always, in other words, there's always going to be a stationary cost for putting the first one on. In other words, it's going to be, because you're now that, prorating that the cost. The stationary cost is then split among all of Correct. the that's that are there. It's not a, the, the next ballot measure doesn't pay the marginal cost. Correct. They pay Correct. the fixed cost, the marginal cost, split up equally. Correct. Okay. I didn't. I misunderstood that from the earlier conversations about when we were putting them on. On, and now I understand it the correct way. So thank well, you. I, I shared your misunderstanding. In fact, I, I thought that was a pretty clear and extensive discussion that we'd had about that exact topic. So, I don't think your misunderstanding is misplaced. Um, and yeah, because I, I think that there was a very clear strategic discussion we had on precisely that point. Uh, for the reason that the subsequent measures would be incremental cost that and we wanted to have Th that would be the true. bulk of it special funded that would be true as far as how much funding in total is needed but not necessarily how the revenue is collected prorated to each entity after you know what I'm saying so that is true up front but I'm not sure it's true in the rears, I know I'm not making much sense, but I, I, I know, get what I you're know saying. exactly what you're saying. It's just it just differs from what my understanding was when we first made this yes. decision. When, when, I, when you're budgeting, it's always we we say that it's you know again four million dollars for the first one, and then each additional measure on top is five hundred thousand. So that gives us a scope of how much it's going to cost to put the measure on. So if if I in some way explained it poorly in the beginning, my apologies. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't know that it was you. I, I just remember that we had this discussion, and maybe it was wishful thinking on our part. I don't know. But, yeah. uh, well, and it also, we were talking about the strategy of putting one first, because right. we could special fund, special fund it. But yeah. it, obviously, that doesn't matter. Like I say, maybe it was our wishful thinking uh, in doing that. But um, okay. well, that, that was, was that your question, Ms. Martinez, as well? OK. 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 Thank you very much. Is there anything else, members, on the FSR? Uh, well, then, uh, if there's no objection, as amended, uh, the FSR is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us then to item number 10. Item number 10 is the CR report and addendum relative to the fourth construction projects report for fiscal year 2016-17. The Entertainment and Facilities Committee has waived consideration of this matter. Now, there should be uh, before you uh, an, a written amendment uh, to this as well. 
And uh, Mr. Williams, is it necessary to read this in? I guess we probably should, the amendment. Sure. This is the amendment from the city administrative officer to the 2016-17 fourth construction projects report addendum recommendation. On June 1, 2017, the CAO's office released an addendum with recommendations regarding the 2016-17 fourth construction project report. Council file 16-114-S3. The CAO's office now requests technical corrections relative to the recommendation to change the amount recommended for transfer based on the availability of funds and to identify the appropriate department responsible for the transfer. The corrected recommendation should read as follows. That the council, subject to the approval of the mayor, authorize the controller to transfer funds totaling $68,921 from Fund 100, Department 54, Capital Improvement Expenditure Program Account, number 00N068, entitled Citywide Nuisance Abatement Program, to the Department of Public Works, Fund 100, Department 74, Contractual Services Account, 003040, um, pardon me, 003040, for maintenance, cleaning, graffiti abatement, and bulky item removal services on the Community Redevelopment Agency Future Development Properties. All right. Thank you very much. Um, before we uh, get to the discussion of this item, I do just want to let the city attorney's office know that um, we are proceeding apace with the agenda, so we may, in fact, have an opportunity to get to closed session earlier than expected. So uh, if you're listening in, come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Ramon Soto with Office of the City Administrative Officer. Before you is the fourth construction projects report for 2016-17. The purpose of such reports is to recommend funding adjustments needed to keep construction projects on track. Financial transactions are for projects in the city's capital improvement expenditure program, various recreational facility projects, general obligation bond funded projects, and general services department construction projects. Significant recommendations on our report include transfers of $2.35 million between departments and funds, transfers of $3.62 million between accounts within departments and funds, transfers of $1.77 million between departments and funds from general obligation bond programs. Also, in accordance with council policy, the report recommends the reauthorization of $37.97 million in MICLA authority for eight projects that were approved by the mayor and council in prior fiscal years. Specifically, their uh, bridge improvement program for six million, City Hall East electrical upgrade project, which includes ITA server farm, uh, server farm project with 15 million, the El Pueblo capital improvement program in the amount of 1.149 million, Manchester Junior Arts Vision Theater uh, in the amount of 3.7 million, Rancho Cienega master plan in the amount of 7.5 million, uh, South Park project for 1.5 million. Bureau of Street Services, 6th Street Bridge uh, Yard Project in the amount of $2.12 million, and an environmental work for the Civic Center building in the amount of $1 million. And then, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Williams just covered the uh, addendum as well. So we have staff available for any specific questions on any of the projects or transactions. Very good. Members? This is really small potatoes, but um, the G2 property, there's a recommendation in, in here for $13,000 for fencing and security. That's a big property, and uh, uh, I think the estimates are actually much higher. So uh, for so CA, my notes, the CAO estimates the total cost is 263000 So do you know what the disparity is there between what's recommended in this and the other I, I don't, sir. Um, from? I do not. I do not have the particular uh, information on that. And I believe that the staff person will be working on it is not here either. Okay. Can is it okay if uh, yeah. we get back to you before this item goes to council? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to make sure that you know that extra quarter of a million is available from some source so that we can ensure that that site is secured because it actually 
if there's any site that we need to have secured, it's probably that one because of the right. potential dangers that, that are involved. Um, okay. That's actually all I have. Anything else, members? Okay. Uh, if there's no objection then, as amended, uh, this matter will be, uh, this item will be approved as amended. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings up item number 13. Item number 13 is a joint report from the Department of General Services, Public Works Bureau of Engineering, and Public Works Bureau of Street Lighting relative, relative to a citywide plan for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, a Public Works and Gang Reduction Energy and Environment and Entertainment and Facilities Committees have waived consideration of this matter. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Good afternoon. Gabriel with the Department of General Services. Norma Saki with the Bureau of Street Lighting. The report before you lays out a plan for um, the installation of EV chargers in our city facilities. The goal of the plan is to provide cleaner air by facilitating the use of low and zero emission vehicles. Um, the plan uh, lays out a process for the installation of EV chargers in our city facilities for use by our residents, uh, our employees, and visitors to city buildings. Um, this year, we started the process that will ultimately install 84 EV chargers in City Hall and City Hall East. Um, the Bureau of Street Lighting has also continued the installation of EV chargers on street light poles. And this report includes a recommendation to um, allocate funds uh, to pay for the street light EV chargers. We submitted an amendment to our recommendations based on um, the amount that's available in the UB for your consideration. Okay. Uh, and why don't we go ahead and ask Mr. Williams then to please read in that amendment. The amended recommendation is as follows that the council, subject to the approval of the mayor, authorize the controller to transfer $266,150 from the unappropriated balance, fund number 100, slash 58, account number 580212, electrical vehicle charging stations, to the Bureau of Street Lighting, fund number 100, slash 84, account number 006020, operating supplies and expense, for the purchase and installation of electric vehicle chargers on streetlight poles in various locations. Thank you. I have to say, uh, my staff was so excited about this item. It's about the most excited I've seen them about anything because of the state of electric vehicle charging in City Hall right now. And I think they saw, you know, a ray of sunshine and hope uh, coming from this item. So, so thank you. Um, in terms of implementation, aside from the funding of it, um, implementation and planning, how is that going to be uh, conducted so that we ensure that we're getting most efficient uh, use of these, not only the infrastructure, but the time in which it's used as well. As far as the City Hall and City Hall East projects that everyone is excited about, yeah. um, that's taken up a few months of this current fiscal year just in extensive planning with the help of BOE and DWP um, to ensure that the electrical systems in these two fairly old buildings can accommodate the, the electrical demand that 84 chargers is, is going to place on it. Um, City Hall East, I believe, is due for an upgrade in a few years. So we've also taken the time with Water and Power and Bureau of Engineering to plan for that so that in the future, after we've installed these chargers, they can um, easily connect to whatever new system City Hall East will have. Um, so right now the project is in the final stages of, of design. Um, we will uh, work with the Building and Safety Department for a pre-plan check to ensure that everything will be smooth. Um, and next fiscal year there's funding identified in the budget for EV chargers and that's what um, will be used for those two projects. Does City Hall East have rooftop photovoltaic? I do 
not believe so. That's something maybe we ought to be looking into uh, to help power those, uh, that infrastructure. Okay, uh, members? I have a question. Ms. Um, Martinez. So you're looking at installing 50 station next year. Do you have any, any idea of where the 50 uh, stations will be located? The 50 stations for the street lights, mm -hmm. Ms. Martinez? Uh, yes, the 50 stations, we do have tentative locations that we're going to be working to deploy them out within the next month or so. So we do have, I do have a list of where those will be located. I just want to make sure that we're taking into consideration that when we're deploying this type of technology, that we are taking into consideration the communities that for decades have uh, endured the city's industrial uses. For example, you know, they probably have the, the worst air quality. And I think city vehicles sometimes add to this issue. So just make sure that when you're looking at the 50 locations that we're taking into consideration communities that have been overwhelmed with um, issues of environmental hazards in the past. Yes, yes we are. Um, and the other thing is, do we have any idea of what the f uh, financial estimate is going to be for that project? For the 50 stations on streetlights, right now we have about 30 stations that have been out there for about nine months, and those 30 stations have seen uh, over 11,000 hits or uses, and they've brought in a, close to $40,000. So that's kind of, it's basically covering the electricity and some of the, um, the revenue that may have to go back to DOT because of meters that were removed. But um, so far that's what we're looking at as far as revenue okay. for, those nine, for those 30 stations. Mr. Blumenfield. My question is along those lines in terms of the revenue. So. I'm assuming, or maybe I shouldn't, are these complete cost recovery EV stations? Right now they are looking like they're going to be cost recovery. Um, we're charging between $1 to $3 per hour, depending on where it's located and if we had to remove a meter. So it's covering the electricity, uh, any revenue for DOT, and then whatever maintenance uh, that we have to do. And how does that compare to market rate, like if I go to the mall and plug in? I think that's about right. We did, before we did this project, we did call around to other cities, and they were ranging between zero, you know, free to about $3. We didn't really see anything over $3. Um, I think some, some malls are free, so I think it, it kind of is in there. I mean, because, you know, once we're actually covering, especially the, the, the marginal difference to cover the, make sure that we're fully covering the cost is probably not that much in terms of when someone plugs in, whether they're paying, you know, a dollar or a dollar ten or something. So, in theory, we shouldn't, you know, deploying this project shouldn't be dependent on 256 million or, or whatever our amount is. We should basically, as a finance m model, have an infinite capacity to put these things out everywhere if they're covering themselves. Yes, and that's our goal is to cover the cost um, and basically to promote EV throughout the city. So we're having we're, we're putting in money up front. Are we actually intending on getting that money back? In are we, are we paying ourselves back, or we're just we're just laying out the cost, and then the money that comes back goes into the general fund, or how does that work? Well, the money that comes back to us is basically just covering the electricity uh, revenue for DOT and whatever maintenance. We, it really doesn't bring a lot of profit back as far as covering uh, this cost. I think it's just uh, the city's effort to promote EV. Okay, so maybe we. Why, why shouldn't we add a tiny percentage onto the cost, onto the marginal cost of each of these, you know, EV stations so that we cover the fixed cost of putting them in, thereby allowing us to put as many without having to be dependent on coming back to us for these. And I think, I think we could look at that. You know, the first 30 that we did put out, those were pilots. I mean, we considered it our first phase. Right. So we weren't sure exactly how much of the use we were going to see. So we can look at that to see exactly what we can add that wouldn't really be, you know, uh, too much, but still potentially get back the money so we can con continue the program. Right. And so I'm we can saying, take a look not, at that. I'm not trying to create a revenue model here Just necessarily the, or because we have the public policy interest of getting these out here, but just a, enough of a, a revenue to cover the costs of the fixed cost because we, I mean, if we do that, then, That's correct. then your deployment schedule just, it's completely scalable and it explodes. And we'll, right. We'll have these right. things all over the place. So I think it, since they've been out there only nine months, we'll take a look at that and then figure out what that cost would be. Okay. I'd love to see you report back on that. Okay, uh, sure. The, 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 the marginal cost needed to fully 
cover the um, fixed cost. The upfront cost. cost, yeah. Great. Anything else, members? All right. Um, if there's nothing further, yeah, that is a very good suggestion for that report back. So um, with that, if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and approve the item as amended uh, with the written amendment and then also the request for uh, the report back on full cost recovery. So thank you very much. And that brings us then uh, into our closed session items. So if you're not here on closed session, uh, if you could please step out so we can proceed with our first matter. All right. Um, the committee has completed all of its agenda items. There being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. If I had this during